Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Michael Kasalniak. I'm the safety chair of the Colorado Pilots Association. And each month we do a uh, presentation uh, for the membership. And we've been doing this now. This will be our third year that we've been doing this. I would imagine that. Our uh, special guest tonight for our presentation is Mr. Steve uh, uh, Antonuccio. Ah. Antonuccio, you know, I yeah, wrote that down. <laughs> that's all right. So I wouldn't forget it. And I, ah. Okay, uh, Steve's going to talk about the history of the Alexander Aircraft and Film Company that were located in Colorado Springs. Uh, Steve presently resides in Pueblo, Colorado. He has a master's degree in library science and has worked in libraries for over 30 years. In 2018, he published a memoir on his career called There is No Such Thing as a Typical librarian. For 20 years, he worked for the Pikes Peak Library District, operating their cable access channel, 1-7. He produced over 100 video programs on the local history of Pikes Peak region. He also created an archive and collection of over 150 historic films, most of them produced by the Alexander Film Company. And uh, just as a side note, I watched one of his uh, productions on YouTube today. It was very informative, and he has an extensive library on YouTube of documentaries that he has produced so welcome steve thank you very much for coming on board for this presentation i want to thank michael and i want to thank brian for testing everything earlier um, as michael said i wrote a book about my 30-year career working in libraries called there's no such thing as a typical librarian um, this book is available for purchase on amazon for 20 dollars um, in the book there are two chapters related to the alexander film and aircraft company one is a, a general history, and the other one is on one of the, the men that worked for the Alexander Film Company for 30 years named Jim Bates. He started right out of high school in 1936, uh, trained as a cinematographer. With the exception of two years, he spent in the Army Signal Corps as a combat photographer. And he jumped at D-1 with the 82nd Airborne and photographed the war in Europe until the fall of Berlin. Uh, including, uh, in, in particular, this battle, the Battle of Cologne, he shot this tank battle, very famous tank battle. Um, and I did a documentary on Jim in 1994. It was the 50th anniversary of D-Day, and it's called Scenes of War. And you can view the entire documentary on, uh, on YouTube. Um, but the interesting thing was we got to become good friends. He donated a lot of the films. He collected everything. He saved everything. And he saved a lot of the films he produced, the commercials he produced for the Alexander Film Company. And he donated them to the library as well as some photography, some of the war photography he did. Um, but today I'm gonna focus on the uh, Alexander Aircraft Company, um, which was in operation from 1926 to 1933. It wasn't a very long time that they were making uh, the Alexander Eagle Rock biplane, but it was the most successful biplane of that time. They made about a thousand of them. Um, and the book that I'm using to do this program is called Alexander Eagle Rock. It's written by Colonel John DeFries. Um, he was a Air Force pilot, and then he was a good writer. He got into public relations. He was stationed at Peterson Air Force Base. And then he got interested in the history of the Alexander Eagle Rock Company. And he wrote a book when he retired and published it uh, in 1985. Now, the book is no longer in publication, but you can get used copies on YouTube. So if you're really interested in Alexander Eagle Rock, the Alexander Aircraft Company, it's an excellent book. It really goes into detail because he has that pilot experience uh, in terms of what they went through to manufacture these planes, the Alexander Eagle Rock biplane and the Alexander Eagle Rock uh, monoplane bullet. Um, but anyway, you can get this book on YouTube. I'm sorry, get this book on Amazon. <laughs> now, this is the distinctive Alexander Eagle Rock logo. Um, this plane is in the Wise Broad Museum in, the, the, uh, uh, in Pueblo Aircraft Museum. It was refurbished by a man by the name of Don Bymaster. And uh, he wanted to put it in the Colorado Springs Airport, but he got in a fight or there was some controversy. It's where it should be, because that's where the Alexander Eagle Rock was manufactured in Colorado Springs. So it's going to go to the Centennial Airport eventually, but right now it's in the Weisbrod Museum in Pueblo. 
If you haven't been to the Weisbrod Museum, I recommend it. It's two, two hangars filled with mostly military planes. They have a B-29 in there. And there's a big history in Pueblo uh, during World War II. They had an airfield uh, training field um, where they taught the crew and the pilots for the B-17s and the B-24s. In fact, uh, Clark Gable went through Pueblo and learned how to be a gunner in a B-17, and then eventually went to Europe and flew several missions. But these are the two brothers that started the company. Um, they're uh, from Keokuk, Iowa, extremely different in personalities. And I think that's what worked well in uh, creating their business because they complemented each other's strength. Uh, and they were different in age, there's eight year difference in age. Uh, J. Don on the left, Julian Don Alexander. And to confuse things even more, they both went by Don. J. Don Alexander and Don Miller Alexander. He went by Don M, the younger brother. But very different in personalities. J. Don was very outgoing. Um, he was an extrovert. Um, he was a great manager. He could manage people. He could inspire, inspire people. He was a natural salesman. And he had some wonderful business ideas that made the, uh, the Alexander Company very successful. The younger brother was, and uh, J. Don was kind of the heart of the company. The younger brother was the brains of the company. He was brilliant. He was a, a road scholar. He was electrical engineer, and he could provide the technical support that they needed to make their company successful. Uh, but again, he was very shy, uh, never married, never married until he was in his early 60s. And I'll tell that story at the end of this presentation. It's kind of interesting. Uh, but for the most part, he lived with his brother his whole life. In fact, he lived with him when he was an adult. Uh, J. Don had married Gertrude Metz. They were both uh, about eight years older than uh, Don Miller. And uh, when uh, J. Don was about 21, he moved to Spokane, Washington with his wife. And his father died about that time. And the younger brother, Don Miller, missed his brother so much that he begged his mother to let him move in to, into, to Washington. So eventually he moved to Washington, lived with his brother. His brother and his wife pretty much raised him from the time he was 14. He went to high school in Spokane, Washington. And he went to, for one year at the Colorado School of Mines, but then he missed his brother and he moved back to Spokane and, and finished up school there and got his degree in electrical engineering. And as you can see, like I said, very shy and introvert, but just a genius in terms of the, the technology that they needed to make their company successful. And here's the young J. Don Alexander, uh, almost like an Elon Musk at this time, very innovative, had some great ideas, came up with a multi-million dollar idea when, he, uh, when they came up with the Alexander Film Company um, and started producing advertising playlets. Uh, but the, the two brothers worked extremely well together. In fact, when Don M graduated um, from Spokane in, with a degree in electrical engineering, um, they decided to go into business together. And uh, J. Don, the older brother, was a salesman. He would go out and sell the electrical contracts that started the Alexander Electric Company in Spokane. Um, the younger brother would provide the uh, technical support, design the, the electrical plans, uh, put it together and made sure they worked uh, correctly. Well, what happened was, is when uh, uh, Don M graduated from uh, college with a degree in electrical engineering, they decided to go into business together. And it was a perfect marriage of their abilities. Uh, J. Don, the salesman, would go out and sell the electrical contracts. And Don M, the, the electrical engineer, would make sure that the, the uh, uh, do the drafting on it and make sure that everything worked properly. And the company was very successful. And then one day someone came to them and wanted them to do a sales film. Um, and they had never done a sales film before. And uh, usual J. Don, ever the salesman, said yes to everything. Um, and as always, his brother would bail him out. He went to his brother and said, can we do this? He said, I'll figure out how to do it. And they made a sales film and the client was very happy. And that was bir the birth of the Alexander Film Company in 1919. And then... J. Don came up with this multi-million dollar idea. Now you gotta understand this is before um, radio advertising, this is before television advertising. 
And he came up with this concept to produce what he called advertising playlists to be shown in movie theaters. And what happened was he saw this interest in the silent films. People were no longer going to the opera houses. They were going to the silent movie theaters to see their favorite stars of that era, Charlie Chaplin, Rudolph Valentino, Lillian Gish. And he saw this mass audience going to the movie theaters. And he also saw the growth of the middle class, the uh, roaring 20s, uh, the mass production of automobiles, of household appliances. Uh, and he realized these companies that were out there that were trying to sell their products, that they had an opportunity to get their products in front of a mass audience. And so what he thought he could do was, you know, produce these commercials and show them in the movie theaters. Now, today you can't go to a movie theater without seeing nine minutes of commercials uh, before the movie. Um, and he was the one that came up with this concept of doing advertising playlists. And it was win, win, win for everyone. It was win for the theater owner because it gave them an opportunity to uh, generate more revenue. It was win um, uh, for the businesses because they had an opportunity to show their products uh, to a mass audience. And it was a win for the Alexander Film Company because they took a percentage of the commercial sales and they also produced the commercials. And it was very successful. They did it all through the state of Washington. And then Jay Don realized, because he was the only one that was doing this, he came up with this concept that this idea would work on a national basis. So he thought the one thing that he needed to do, because this is before overnight uh, mail delivery, this is before long distance phone calls, was to locate his company in the center of the uh, uh, country. So he moved everything to Denver, Colorado. And then another idea he had, he believed in uh, the, the future of commercial air travel. Um, and he thought that, and he was a pilot himself. He was one of the first people to get a pilot's license. I think the 91st person to get a pilot's license. And he thought that he could make his salesmen pilots as well. This way they could small into the, fly into these small towns, service their customers, and then fly out. It turned out the salesman never did learn how to fly planes. You know, you're a pilot or a salesman, you're usually not both. Um, but he went to his brother and, he, and they looked at the best planes that, that were out there at the time. They bought some long run biplanes and there hadn't been a, a, a real uh, advance in aviation since the end of World War I. So he went to his brother and said, you know, I bet we can make our own plane. We can sell it to other people and then we could use it to help our salesmen in our company. And so they came up with the Alexander Eagle Rock uh, biplane. And uh, it's interesting, this is his wife, Gertrude Metz, christening the plane. And there's a story in the a Alexander Eagle Rock book that talks about uh, uh, when she christened the plane and she had trouble breaking the bottle. She bent the nose uh, cone on, the, on that plane. Eventually they had to take it off, reveal the, reveal the bolt that was holding on the prop. And then she was able to break the champagne bottle. But it kind of foretold the story of the plane because it wasn't that good. The first model of the Alexander Eagle Rock could fly, but that's about all it could do. It was very heavy. And it was a real problem. They knew they were going to have to redesign it before they could manufacture it. But they didn't know at the time that they had this young genius working for them. He was 19 years old. Al Mooney, uh, graduate of uh, Denver South High School. Uh, from the moment he could read, he read everything he could at the Denver Public Library on aviation and aeronautics. He was self-taught. He wanted to be a pilot himself. In fact, he was going to go to the Colorado School of Mines and he was saving up money working construction. And one day he saw one of the long run biplanes flying over. And he actually followed the plane in his car to see where it landed. He got out, he talked to J. Don Alexander, 19 years old and said, you know, I really, um, I'm kind of self-taught, but I know everything there is about aeronautics. I would like to help you with building this aircraft. And so they hired him. He had to work for the, the, the aeronautic person. So he didn't have as much input. He was more uh, just involved in the manufacturing. And they put the plane together and it was kind of clunky. He knew what was wrong with it, but he didn't want to you know, go over his boss's head. So he decided to go back to school. He, he, he gave his notice and he, and he said, I'm gonna go to the Colorado School of Mines. And he thought, felt a little braver now that he was leaving. And he went to talk to Jay Don. He says, you know, Jay Don, I know what's wrong with this plane. I know all the things that we can do to make it better. 
you know, and Jadon looked at him at first, this 19 year old punk kid telling him how to run his company, but he was very open-minded. He said, all right, well, tell me what's, what's wrong with it. And Al Mooney went through in detail, everything that they needed to do to improve the Alexander Eagle Rock. And Jadon ended up firing his boss and hiring the 19 year old Al Mooney to redesign the Eagle Rock. And this is the plane he designed, the 1927 Alexander Eagle Rock, very successful, most successful biplane of its time. They built about a thousand of these planes from 1927, 1926 was the first model until 1933. Um, very popular biplane, the most popular biplane of its time. Now just checking, can you all hear me still? Am I coming through? I assume I am. Yep, we're doing good. Okay, good, good. In fact, it was so, it had such a great reputation. You can see the, the redesigned Alexander Eagle Rock that Al Mooney put together, that this young man came to Denver to talk to Jay Don, to have him build a plane for him that he could fly across the Atlantic, of course, Charles Lindbergh. Um, and Jay Don had to tell him, he says, you know, behind in our production, because um, there's such a demand for a plane, it's gonna have to wait about six months. And, and of course, Charles Lindbergh wanted a custom plane with a larger uh, gas tank and some other options too. He said, we could probably build it in six months, but it's gonna be about a year before we can get this done. And Charles Lindbergh was in a race to be the first one to cross the Atlantic. So he said, oh, I'm sorry, I gotta find someone else to do it. And he did find someone else to build the Spirit of St. Louis. And of course the rest is history. But his first choice was flying an Alexander Eagle Rock uh, biplane. And had they been able to get this plane built in time, that's what it would have been in that flew across the Atlantic. And there are many Alexander Eagle Rock biplanes that are still flying today. You can see this beautiful uh, Alexander Eagle Rock, the Alexander Eagle Rock logo on the tail of the plane. Um, again, one of the most popular planes of its time. And so everything was going well, the company was going well, and uh, um, the building of the Alexander Eagle Rock was going well uh, biplane. And Jay Don went to Don Mooney and he said, I'd like you to build me a, a contemporary monoplane um, that has an enclosed cockpit that we can uh, market. And so I'll, and he said, I'll let you design it however you want. And uh, Al Mooney designed this beautiful Alexander Eagle Rock bullet Unfortunately, only 11 of them were built. Beautiful plane, low wing uh, monoplane um, with uh, enclosed cockpit. It fit four people in their advertisements. They said, four people, your luggage and a dog could fly in this plane. Now it was innovative. It was one of the first planes to have retractable landing gear. And so when the plane was in the air, it made it so much more aerodynamic, it could fly 150 miles an hour uh, with a 100 horsepower engine. Um, now they had to pass this test where they put it into a spin and took it out of a spin. The government required them to do that. Um, and they had some difficulty. In fact, they lost three of their planes and three of their test pilot pilots trying to do this, take it out of a spin. They eventually fixed the problem and they were able to put it into a spin and take it out of a spin. And it was ready to manufacture. This is around, uh, I think, September of 1929. So Jay Don took it to an air show in Chicago <clears throat> and it was a hit of the air show, very innovative at the time. And he came back from the air show with a contract to build 80 of these airplanes. And of course, most of us know what happened in October of 1929, the stock market crashed. And the market for these small uh, planes completely disappeared. And unfortunately, a lot of people who had uh, signed a contract could, couldn't come up with the money to have him complete the airplane. So they had to stop manufacturing the bullet, unfortunately. They never did build more than 11 of these planes. In fact, none of them are in existence today. But it was a beautiful biplane. I'm sorry, beautiful monoplane, low-wing monoplane. And then Al Mooney went on to create his own company, Mooney Aircraft, and he built a plane very similar to the Alexander Eagle Rock Bullet, a low wing uh, monoplane with retractable landing gears, uh, could seat four people and could fly at about 150 miles an hour. And this plane was very successful. Some of you may have flown the Mooney M20. Um, they started manufacturing it in 1955. 
Uh, Mooney actually went on to work for Lockheed and other companies, Al Mooney did, but they still manufactured his plane until 2019. Um, and 10,000 of these planes have been built. Very successful plane. Um, beautiful plane, you can see flying with the landing gear up. Um, and I was going online, I think some of the older models sell for about 100,000, the newer models are 600 to 700,000. The company is still in existence, but all they're doing now is supplying parts for the Mooney craft, aircraft. But you can see it's very similar to the Alexander Eagle Rock bullet that Al Mooney had designed back in 1929. A low wing monoplane with four seats um, and room for a dog. In fact, this was the advertisement for the plane back in 1929. The Eagle Rock bullet with a load of 750 pounds, four people, a dog and full tanks of gasoline behind a 100 horsepower Kinner motor over the mountains in the Pikes Peak region. The bullet carried 600 pounds of disposable load, including two pilots over Pikes Peak at an altitude of 19,000 feet. The ceiling was estimated several thousand feet higher. It could probably go to 22, 23,000, but there's not a lot of air up there at 23,000 feet. And so with the success of the Alexander Eagle Rock biplane, and the success of the Alexander Film Company, J. Don and Don M. found themselves to be multimillionaires. And this is during the Great Gatsby era. And if you were a multimillionaire, this is how you would dress with a fur coat, felt hat, the big cigar. And of course, J. Don's personality, the extrovert, it was a perfect outfit for him at that time. And of course, this is the Roaring Twenties. Um, but his brother, just the opposite, the conservative engineer wearing a conservative suit, smoking a pipe. But again, their talents worked together. That's why they were successful. And they were very close. They lived together their entire lives. And this is their facility in uh, Inglewood, Colorado on Broadway. And everything that J. Don touched at that time, this is the Inglewood, Colorado offices um, for Alexander Industries, turned to gold. Everything he did was successful. Um, and then they were planning, they were offered, in fact, everybody was bidding for their, their uh, a company to, to locate. And Colorado Springs made an offer for them to come down to Colorado Springs, which they accepted, a free land, and of course, a beautiful location to shoot their commercials with uh, Garden of the Gods and Pikes Peak in the background. And they were just about to move to Colorado Springs when unfortunately there was an industrial accident in their old facility. Um, where 11 of their uh, employees were killed in a fiery accident, uh, uh, putting the dope on uh, the wings of their, their uh, Alexander Eagle Rock uh, biplanes. And I'm gonna read uh, some quotes from a former employee who's a friend of mine, Leland Fights. He died in 2013, the age of 88, but he worked for the Alexander Film Company for 20 years and he was their historian. I interviewed him for the article, or for the chapter I did in my book but I'm gonna read some of the things he said at that time. Early mass production of aircraft presented unique safety challenges. On April 20th, 1928, an accident in Alexander Industries aircraft manufacturing plant resulted in 11 fatalities. A spark from an electric fan in the paint department created the initial explosion and fire. The deaths happened because in the room where they applied the so-called dope, which was highly flammable, the doors swung in and when the explosion happened, the people rushed these doors and pushed against them, said Leland Fights. And 11 people perished in that fire. Following the explosion, they faced criminal manslaughter charges and potential demise of their thriving company. The Alexander brothers were found guilty on four counts of violating the Colorado Facilities Act. They were each fined $1,000 and given suspended sentences of 90 days. And they could have very easily gone to jail for a very long time. And so they were kind of persona non grata in Denver. Uh, fortunately, they had already signed this contract with Colorado Springs, and they moved everything down to uh, Colorado Springs off of uh, Nevada Avenue. Um, on April 23rd, the business was shut down for the investigation. So just a few day days later, the Alexanders moved their entire business to the sleepy resort town of Colorado Springs. Officials of the city made an attractive offer of free land in a beautiful scenic location for motion picture production. In one night, 75 trucks and a crew of employees and volunteers moved the entire operation to 260 acres on North Nevada Avenue. And this is the new uh, production facility for the Alexander Eagle Rock at that time. 
And uh, the, the accident had a real effect on, on Jay Dunn, and he made sure that the, the new facility had all the safety standards that were needed uh, to produce these airplanes safely. Um, the fatal accident had an effect on Jay Dunn Alexander. He treated his employees like family. In fact, he called them members instead of employees. Very early on, he offered tuition assistance, medical and retirement plans, and stock options to his employees or members before it was done by anyone else. And here's uh, some of, they hired a lot of female employees to work uh, doing the, the film editing. And here's the Alexander campus. You can see the manufacturing facility on the right. They stopped manufacturing the Alexander Eagle Rock in 1933. And of course, in 1929, they stopped manufacturing the Alexander Eagle Rock bullet, um, but they leased out the uh, manufacturing area to other companies. But this is the uh, entire campus, the administration building. Uh, the sound stage in the back. Um, they were the largest employer in Colorado Springs in their heyday about 1951. At the pinnacle of the Alexander film business, 1951, the company claimed 24,000 advertising accounts, 700 employees in Colorado Springs, and their ads were being shown in 10,000 theaters in the US and 1,400 in Canada and other foreign countries. The Alexander Film Company paid 2.7 million to the theaters, maintained a 4 million backlog of orders and had 4 million in assets and a yearly payroll of 2.5 million. And so everything was going very well, making lots of money. Theaters were very popular back in the late 40s and the early 50s. And then television came along, which uh, created a real problem for them. They thought it was just gonna be a passing phase and they didn't wanna do television commercials they didn't wanna alienate the movie theaters that were their primary client. Uh, but they finally had to, uh, to start producing commercials. And it's kind of funny that they are producing a, a television commercial on a television set. Um, they just about ruined the company when TV came along. There were about 17,000 theaters running Alexander movie ads. And a few, days, a few years later after that, when TV came along, those theaters started closing. The one thing that saved the company during those years was drive-in theaters. It became popular and during the summer months, business was pretty good, said Leland Fights. And I remember going to drive-ins and seeing those commercials that had the countdowns 10 minutes before the feature starts. And those commercials were produced by the Alexander Film Company. They were the largest producer of advertising playlists nationwide. And this is Jay Don, again, the extrovert. He loved to give tours of this facility. It's kind of a comic picture of him standing next to his cardboard cutout, but he would give tours, he'd talk to anyone. And again, he was the heart of the company until his death in 1955 at the age of 70. Um, and then the company kind of slowly started to go down after that. Um, his brother knew that he could not manage the company. He was not you know, he couldn't manage people. And so after his brother died, he sold the company and he remained on the uh, board of directors, but he kind of got out of the daily, daily operations. Um, and then Leland Fights talked to Jay Don just a few days before he died. He said this, one thing I remember very well was the last conversation I had with Jay Don. And this was only a few days before the man died, remember Leland Fights. We've been talking about his life and I said, it must've been awfully wonderful to live the full life and turned an idea into an organization that supported many hundred families that made friends all over the world. I will always admire you for what you have done. And then he said, Leland, we have been total failures. And that really surprised me because I thought he was a great success. He said, if we had played our card right, cards right and held on to the aircraft business, we would have had a factory that reached from here to the Air Force Academy. He died disappointed. And he was right. They closed down their aircraft manufacturing uh, in 1933, had they been able to keep it open until the late 1930s, they would have been like Boeing. They would have gotten one of those, because it had a great reputation for building aircraft. They would have had one of those military contracts to build fighters, uh, uh, to build uh, bombers at that time. Um, and then that company would have turned into company equivalent to Boeing, I'm sure, because of the dynamics of this man. And this is the administration building again on North Nevada. Um, unfortunately, this building is torn down. A production uh, truck that they used for producing commercials in the 60s. 
a lot of the actors and actresses were students from Colorado College. Uh, there never lacked beautiful young women to be in their commercials. Uh, they used Colorado College co-eds to, to act. So they always had talent they could use. And again, this is the campus uh, during the heyday of the production uh, facility when they were the largest employer in Colorado Springs. In the 50s and 40s, you either worked at the Alexander Film Company or the Broadmoor Hotel. Those are the two major employers. Now, I talked earlier about Jim Bates, who provided me with a lot of the films um, that we have in the collection at the library. And we did the 1994 documentary called Scenes of War, which you can watch in its entirety on YouTube about his year as a combat photographer. Um, and of course, he shot this famous, famous tank battle at the foot of the Cologne Cathedral, Battle of Cologne, um, that they're gonna make into a movie. Uh, there's a book called uh, uh, Spearhead on the Third Armored Division. He followed this Third Armored Division. It's an excellent book. Um, and it's going to be made into the movie. They're writing the script right now, but it'll, uh, it'll probably be produced in a couple of years. It's written by Adam Makos, uh, who, whose uh, other book is being made into a movie that's gonna be released in October, and I'm forgetting the name of the book, but it's about fighter pilots in the Korean War. And so this is my favorite picture that Jim Bates taught, uh, shot. This is in the collection of the Pikes Peak Library District. You can go to the digital archives and see these photos and other photos that he shot. This is of Winston Churchill right at the end of the war. He's touring the German Reichs Reichstag. In fact, he's touring it with the Russians. And what I love about this picture, this is just a couple days after Germany surrendered. Uh, he's not, there's not a look of celebration on this face. It's more of a look of relief that this horrible war that killed millions of, of soldiers and civilians on both sides is finally over. And it's just, you know, it's just a pensive look on his face. He's thinking about everything that has happened up to this point. Now, Jim was a great technician. He designed things, an amateur engineer, and he designed this innovative helicopter mount that could shoot uh, rock steady aerial footage. Now, this is before drones, this is before Steadicam. Um, and it was very popular at the time, particularly among Madison Avenue, they who wanted to shoot commercials and shoot aerial shots that hired the company to do it and shot this famous 1964 commercial uh, on top of. Uh, Pinnacle Rock in Moab, Utah. Um, um, but they also used it for uh, theatrical film companies that wanted rock steady aerial shots. And it really was a very innovative uh, uh, helicopter mount that was used quite a bit. In fact, this is Pinnacle Rock. Uh, it says Castle Rock, but it's in Moab, Utah. This is the second commercial they shot. They shot one in 1964 and Jim was at the first shoot. And then they did it again in 1973. I found this commercial. I didn't have a, uh, uh, the, uh, any, any uh, visuals of the first uh, commercial shot in 64, other than uh, the actual commercial, which I'm going to show you at the end of the program. But Jim told the story. He said that they took the 64 Chevrolet, put it on top of Pinnacle Rock, and they put this poor, terrified 19-year-old model in the car. In fact, she was so terrified that she insisted on a technician being up there when they shot the commercial. And uh, you can see the technician in the commercial, he's kind of hiding, hunched down behind the car. You can see his shadow underneath the car. And so he was there so she would feel better. And they got all their shots done for the day and they were getting ready to pick them up, take them off of the, the peak of top of Pinnacle Rock. And then the wind started to pick up and it looked like they were gonna have to leave them up there overnight in that car until the wind died down in the morning and it took them off the, the rock. Well, the technician's wife was at the location at that time um, and she was pretty upset. She didn't like the idea of her husband spending the night in a car with this beautiful model. So she said, I don't care what you have to do. My husband is not spending the night with that model in the car. You get him down now. Uh, so fortunately, towards dusk, the wind did die down. Jim told me this story. And they were able to uh, uh, take the model and the technician down. Everybody was happy, especially the technician's wife. Now, there are some Alexander Eagle Rocks that are still flying. Um, there are also many that are on display 
This one is in the United Terminal at Denver International Airport. Many of you have probably seen this plane. I mean, I've been by it several times. Beautiful Alexander Eagle Rock uh, on display hanging from the ceiling. Um, there's also one on display in the Seattle Airport. You can see the distinctive Alexander Eagle Rock logo on the tail of the plane. And there's one in the Wise Broad, Muse Wise Broad Museum in Pueblo, Colorado. This is Donna Bymaster, her father, Don Bymaster, who has since passed away. He owned a motorcycle shop in Colorado Springs and he restored this Eagle Rock. And he was going to give it to the Colorado Springs Airport where it should be. I mean, that's where most of the Eagle Rocks were made in Colorado Springs. Um, but he got in a fight with the, how are they were gonna display it at the Colorado Springs Airport, the airport manager. And he changed his mind. It's eventually going to be in the Centennial Airport in Arapaho uh, County. Uh, but right now, as far as I know, they haven't moved it yet. It's in the Wise Broad Museum. And if you haven't been to the Wise Broad Museum, it's really worth the trip. You can see the B-29 behind the Alexander Eagle Rock. Of course, the B-29, uh, was the plane, not this specific plane, but it's the plane they used to drop the, the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But they also have all kinds of military planes. And they also have a history of the air base in World War II that was in Pueblo, Colorado, where they trained B-17 and B-24 crews. In fact, Clark Gable came through Pueblo, trained to be a B-17 gunner, and eventually went to England and flew several missions over Europe uh, in World War II, but if you if you if you can do it, I mean the little airport in Pueblo is as tiny as can be, um, but the uh, uh, but the museum is wonderful. It's uh, two hangars full of airplanes, and of course this is a distinctive Alexander Eagle Rock logo. And the way they came up with the logo name is that uh, while they were building the first biplane, an eagle, a wounded eagle, came into the hangar. They took care of it. And of course, they decided to name the plane after it, calling it Eagle Rock, and of course, Rock for the Rocky Mountains. Unfortunately, there are no um, Alexander uh, uh, bullet monoplanes out there. None exist. Although people have made model planes, like one twelfth size model planes that fly. You can go online and see some of these model planes that have been made of the Alexander Eagle Rock bullet. Now, it's going to finish the story about Don Miller Alexander. I said he never got married until his early 60s. Now, what happened was when his brother died in 1955, um, he was living with his sister-in-law in this beautiful home on Wood Avenue. Now, his sister-in-law was 10 years older than him, um, and uh, she had a stroke. She needed help bathing. She needed help getting dressed. And he was very attentive. In fact, she was probably the closest person in his life. He was like a second mother to him. And so they became concerned, this is the 1950s, that people would talk that these two single people were living together uh, in the same house. Um, and uh, they decided to get married. It was more a marriage of convenience. He married a sister-in-law who was in her 70s. He was in his 60s. And they remained married until her death in 1970. And then he died in 1971. And they lived in this beautiful house, 17,000 square feet. I had a chance uh, to tour this home and it's absolutely gorgeous. The couple that owns it, the husband is actually an airline pilot. I think he works for Delta, not quite sure. So it's kind of fitting that the home belongs to a pilot since they built the Alexander Eagle Rock biplane and the bullet. Here's the ballroom uh, for the, uh, the home. And this is the headstone, uh, the uh, uh, family plot at Evergreen. It says J. Don died in 1953, but I, as far as I know, it was 1955. Um, but you can see his wife is buried there. She died in 1970. She was a year older than J. Don. Uh, their son is also buried there. Uh, it's interesting because their son, Don Jr., worked on the Alexander Eagle, uh, Alexander Eagle Rock uh, glider. They had made some gliders, about 20 of them that were used. Uh, in fact, uh, Cheyenne Mountain High School bought one of the gliders. And I'll show you a clip from that, hopefully. And this is the campus again in the heyday, the largest employer in Colorado Springs. 
And you can read about it in my book if you're interested. And certainly if you're interested in Alexander Eagle Rock, go online, this book is great. It really is. It's kind of written from a technician standpoint. He goes into detail about the how many planes they built and what engines they used and, um, and what was going on at the time. And now I'm gonna show you if it works, some of the spots. So you could hear me all the way through since we had that first problem. Okay, great, great. So now I'm gonna try and share the screen and uh, show you this commercial. This is the one that was shot on Pinnacle Rock. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, good. of its own. It stands alone. Chevrolet for 1964. No other automobile offers so much of what so many people desire. With styling that brings you back. Now to you can see the technician now again. behind the car. Chevrolet you can see him kind of hunched over in the shadow. Alone in pure dedication to beauty and relaxation. Alone in jet smooth luxury. Here is space for freedom of movement, enclosed in a Fisher body carving, in motion as quiet as space itself. In a class of its own, Chevrolet for 1964 stands alone. See your Chevrolet dealer. Like I said, they couldn't get away with uh, doing that today, although they probably do it with CGI. <laughs> That's how they would do it. Um, let me see if I can get some of these other commercials up there. Uh, this is, well, this is actually uh, a film that was shot. This was shot, yeah, good, in the 1930s. Um, and it's an Alexander Eagle Rock, um, uh, glider that was purchased by Cheyenne Mountain High School of Colorado Springs. And they actually flew it with their students. Another interesting aspect of life at Cheyenne School was the glider club. Can you see that? And here? This it? glider was purchased from Alexander Aircraft in Colorado Springs. Okay, good. The glider shed was on school grounds and was constructed by Mr. Hinch under the supervision of Frank Evans, who was the shop teacher. The shed was on the west side of the school grounds. The glider was put together and then loaded onto a truck. From the school, it was taken across the school grounds onto a road and then up to Cresta Vista where the present Shine Mountain High School exists. The instructor was Mr. Dwight Spencer. The glider club only existed for one year and that was 1931. Once up on Cresta Vista where there were no roads, no Cresta Road and no 21st Street, it was often taken to a height of 150 feet. The glider had been constructed by Alexander Aircraft in Colorado Springs. Alexander's had originally started in Denver and later moved to Colorado Springs in 1927. 
Alexanders had developed the famous Eagle Rock, which was the name of one of the planes they built. Another interesting aspect in relation to Alexanders is that Charles Lindbergh had wanted to fly the Atlantic in an Alexander plane, but the company could not build it in time for him. To commemorate this glider, a special stamp was made by Cheyenne School honoring the first flight. After one year, the glider was sold to a man who attempted to fly it off of Pike's Peak with disastrous results. Can you imagine doing that today at a high school, the <laughs> liability issues with something like that? Um, let me uh, show you one last, how are we doing for time? Are we okay? Doing great. Okay, let me show you one last clip. And this is a promo of the Alexander Film Company uh, they produced probably 1948. It just tells you about the company. It shows some. Can you see and hear that? This is beautiful Colorado Springs at the foot of Pikes Peak. Six railroads and two airlines offer fast mail and express service. The Pikes Peak region, famed for scenic grandeur and bright sunshine, is a photogenic paradise. Located at Colorado Springs is the Alexander Film Company, world's largest producer and distributor of short-length screen advertising, employing over 600 people at the home studio. From the administration building, the activities of about 150 field representatives are supervised. In the Mammoth Stage Building, the finest of short-length advertising films are produced. And from the specially designed service department building, over 150,000 feet of film are shipped every day to many of the 9,500 theaters which exhibit these movie playlets for more than 24,000 advertisers. Sales of many nationally known products are promoted with Alexander movie programs on a manufacturer-dealer cooperative basis. These films are produced exclusively for the manufacturer and demonstrate his products throughout. The fact that many manufacturers authorize the Alexander Film Company year after year to produce their movies is proof of continued satisfaction. More and more companies are coming to Alexander for the finest of screen advertising, seen every day in thousands of theaters. Now let's follow the production of Alexander short-length advertising from start to finish. First, advertising writers with motion picture experience prepare the scenarios or work with the advertisers on scenarios prepared by them. After the scenarios have been approved, lected, all preparations are subject to the approval of the advertiser's representative assigned for technical supervision. Lights, action camera, and production is underway. Cameramen who know every trick of the trade work with experienced directors and technical supervisors. Meanwhile, the art department is producing the animations and titles 
that help the playlet tell the advertiser's story. Here also is made the dealer's name trailer that will follow the playlet on the theater screen. The films from the stage, art, and sound cameras are processed and edited in the Alexander Film Company's own laboratory. Here, more than one and one half million feet of film a month are developed and printed using exclusive Alexander processes. Coordination of stage, art, sound, and laboratory results in the finest of short-length advertising playlets and identifying trailers such as those that follow. If you are one of the homemakers who find that adding variety to the daily menu is a problem, here's an inexpensive way to vary your meals. Include fresh, tasty bakery goods. For breakfast through dinner, there are many palate-pleasing delights. Your family will agree fresh bakery goods are a delightful addition to every meal. We believe that only the best is good enough for our customers. Every effort is made to assure uniform quality at prices within your budget. Give us a trial. Colorful potted plants bring outdoor beauty inside the home. Flowers always add a note of cheery brightness to any setting, and a tasteful array of delicate blooms denotes the perfect hostess. There is always a wide variety of fresh flowers to make your home a place of beauty. Our selection of fresh flowers is unequaled for colorful beauty. When you need flowers, remember that we are always anxious to serve you. When the family gets together on a project like this, there's real fun for everyone. And for added pleasure, there's a big supply of crystal clear 7-Up in the refrigerator. You see, 7-Up is the all-family drink. There's more fun than ever in your living room when you're the proud owner of a smart new Motorola television set. Motorola is tops in engineering and in styling, too. Motorola gives you the ultimate in performance and a glowing pride of ownership. Smart Motorola cabinets are packed full of amazing new exclusive electronic developments. See Motorola. Your eye tells why Motorola's a better buy. Come in soon for a demonstration of the beautiful, brilliant-toned Motorola radios. Let us give you the complete facts, and you'll agree that Motorola is your best buy. Colorado's famous Garden of the Gods, one of the most beautiful of America's tourist spots. And here's the most beautiful way to see America, in a sparkling new Pontiac, the most beautiful thing on wheels. Powerful, smooth, dependable, and economical, Pontiac is low in price. Your own experience will tell you that dollar for dollar, you can't beat a Pontiac. Equipment, accessories, and trim subject to change. Come in and get the complete facts about the sensational new Pontiacs, a wonderful car to own, to drive, or be seen in. The beautiful Pontiacs are priced just above the very lowest. Hiya, folks. I'm from Philco, famous for quality the world over. I'm Blur. And I'm Smear. We just love television. Not to ruin it, you mean. I'll fix you. Get Philco Balanced Beam Television, peep squeak. No blur, no smear, just a clear picture. Clear, sharp, perfectly focused over the entire picture area. Yes, Philco Balanced Beam brings you the finest picture in television. We will be happy to show you the complete line of new Philco radios. Come in soon and see for yourself why Philco, famous for quality the world over, is your best radio buy. A well-organized service department with special equipment and trained personnel schedules and ships the playlets and attached trailers so that they reach the local theaters each week at the proper time for showing. The advertiser has no screening worries. Before closing, let us consider some of the outstanding advantages of motion picture advertising. The illustrations in printed advertising are motionless, silent, like this. We have the voice of radio, the picture comes to life in natural color, and details are shown in billboard proportions. Thus, we combine sound, action, color, and detail enlargement to produce advertising that commands the undivided attention of millions of theater goers every week as they see a product in use. Screen advertising will sell your product. And that's it. Um... 
I think we're good on time, aren't we? If anybody has any questions. This is Mike. I got a couple questions here. Sure. I was writing down things. Um, the first one I had, all the plans and documents that the company had, are they located in a museum somewhere? Well, a lot of the uh, a lot of the material is in the uh, library where I worked for twenty years, the Pikes Peak Library District, and special collections. Um, the, the the commercials, most of them are on YouTube. I posted on YouTube, or the library has uh, put up on YouTube. Um, the uh, the clip of the uh, uh, from uh, Cheyenne Mountain High School. There's a couple documentaries on. Cheyenne Mountain High School, and that's part of that documentary. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can see most of them on YouTube. Um, again, if you're interested in the aircraft company, the book written by Colonel De DeVries, I think, B-R-I-E-S, is really good. Yeah. That, that has a lot of okay. specific detailed information. Okay, because I was wondering who owns the uh, who owns the right to the rights to the airplane to if somebody wanted to make one. You know, that's a good point. I, I would think it's, I don't know what, what it is with the public domain, but the company went broken or they disbanded the company in 1933. Yeah. The, the film company was still going and there's the film company doesn't exist anymore. It was sold. The original company is nowhere. To, uh, uh, so uh, both the film company, and the aircraft company are gone. I can't imagine anybody has the rights to anything. And you had mentioned uh, that uh, J. Don was the 91st person to get a uh, pilot's license? That's what I understand. There was an article that he was the 91st person to get a private pilot's license, yes. Okay. And I don't know when that was. It might have been after the Eagle Rock was built. I don't know when they started. You guys might know when they started issuing licenses. Do you know? Mm -hmm. when they? Because they didn't do it initially, right? It was something that just happened. No, they didn't. It must have been yeah. in the 19, late 1920s, I think. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, I had another note. Oh, the, uh, it said the glider, uh, the guy bought the glider and flew it off Pikes Peak with disastrous results. So I take it he was killed and the glider was smashed up. I assume it was. Yeah. The guy who read that, uh, uh, he knew the result. I, he's not, I haven't been able to talk to him to find out what exactly happened, but I think they, they, they the guy did die who flew it off of Pikes Peak. Uh, gosh. And uh, let's see. Well, essentially, oh, no students was, were hurt. No students were hurt using it. So they right. they uh, they had got a lot of life out of it for a year, and obviously the kids enjoyed it. Yeah. 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 I was surprised to hear about Al Mooney being one of their employees. That was interesting. At the age of nineteen. Yeah, he was a genius. That. He was a genius, um, and uh, he's from Colorado. Went to uh, South High School. And uh, really, someone who can be very proud of coming out of Colorado and designing these airplanes. Yeah. 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 I understand he used to walk from uh, South High School down down to the Alexander uh, uh, airplane facility facility down on Broadway. Hmm. You might be right. You might be right. I wonder how he ended up in Texas, where the Kerrville, where the company is now. Well, he didn't stay with, he started the Mooney Company. I think his brother was involved with it. And it's, it's I didn't get all the details from the book, um, but he, if, you, if you look him up on Wikipedia, it talks about he worked for Lockheed and other companies too. He was kind of a hired gun after that. People would hire him to design different aircraft, but. Uh, yeah, he was a genius. I mean, considering 19 years old, now even at 21, designing the bullet, and I don't know how, how how many planes had retractable landing gears. That might have even been the first one to have a retractable landing gear in 1929. It sounds amazing. Four people and only 100 horsepower. Yes, and could go 150 miles an hour. Four yeah. people in your in a dog in your luggage. Yeah. And 150. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Has anybody here flown the uh, the Mooney aircraft? There's probably been a, somebody there in that group. Yeah, I flew one today, in fact. <laughs> oh, you did? Great, yeah. great. <laughs> yeah, what year I, is the plane, do you know? The one that you flew? It's 84. 84? And they hold up pretty well, I imagine. Walt has one, too. And they're you all know, retractable? They still have retractable landing gear? Mm -hmm. 
Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's something you'd have to remember every time <laughs> to, to put down and put up. But I'm sure there's warnings on it to let you know. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, this is, excuse me, Dave Elliott. I have two Alexander Eagle Rock projects. How can I get access to whatever the archives are at the uh, at the museum, at the library? You mean you're, you're built, you have two Alexander Eagle Rock planes at your I have, building? I have the parts of two airplanes. Oh, you uh, do, great. Serial number great. are 885 and 985. Uh-huh. Uh, I, you know, you could call the library, but I think your best bet is actually to get one of the books because they, they, it's a real detailed book on, on every plane that was made. I don't know, I don't think the library has the plans, um, but uh, the book is pretty good. I mean, there's some diagrams in the book. I, I have several copies of the book. Oh, you do, you have the book, um, okay, great, you know, great. Are there any archives at the Pioneer Museum? I don't think so. I, I think the library, Pikes Peak Library District probably has the most archives. And I don't, I don't think they have any much material on the planes, but you could call, you can call and check and tell them that you, what you're doing, working on a project. Okay, good. Now, well, are there any, any Alexander Eagle Rocks that are currently flying in Colorado that you know of? That somebody... I think the one at the Wings of the Rockies at Centennial is flyable. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think it's currently flying. Because if you yeah. wanted to examine the plane, you could go to the Wise Broad Museum and yeah. check out the one. I mean, they, they walk right up to it and just see what if there's anything unique about how it was. I, I wish Don Bymaster was still alive. He's the one that restored it, but I'm sure he he might have had some material on it. Right. Yeah, I need to get a paint chip too because I need that Eagle Rock blue. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the logo on the on the tail still? I ha I have the original logos from 1928, 1929 for the two. How are airplanes. they holding up? Are they still okay? Uh, it's old. Fading. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. I'd love to see it. When you Do you know what you're going to do with the planes once you restore them? The one I have title to, my intent is to fly it. The oh, other good. One, I'll use the old parts that aren't airworthy from the two and try uh -huh. to build one that I can con try to convince Colorado Springs to display it. I the airport, that would be wonderful. There needs to be one in the Colorado Springs airport. Yes, this is where they yeah. were born. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Was that logo uh, hand painted? Yes. It was yeah, on the they, original, yeah. The custom painted on every plane. I don't think they had a stencil for it. I think it was custom painted. Yeah, it's a beautiful plane. I mean, they really, uh, really were very successful with the biplane. It's a shame they couldn't get the monoplane to uh, to sell or to build. And like I said, you know, had they not closed down the company in 1933, they, they would have been like Boeing. They would have got one of those big contracts. Yep. I think Boeing started in 1917, didn't it? Started early too. Any other questions? I'm glad we're able to fix that little problem. You can see the show. Um, I do have, as Mike mentioned, I've got a YouTube channel and I have a longer version, History of the Alexander uh, Film Company on there and some other documentaries, a documentary on Jim Bates, uh, Scenes of War, yeah. actually the, the uh, Pikes Peak Library District uh, 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 channel, YouTube channel has it listed there, but you can type in Scenes of War. And the, the film that's coming out in October, they're written by Adam Makos, who's incidentally from Colorado. He lives, if you can get him to do a show, but he's, he's too, I don't know if he would do it, but um, it's called Devotion. And it's on Korean uh, uh, pilots during the Korean War. And it's going to be released in October. And it, there's a lot of buzz about this movie. It's going to be very good, excellent film. And then eventually, I'm not sure when it'll happen, probably in two years, his other book called Spearhead. Um, and there's a connection to Denver as well because the uh, Third Armored Division was headed up by General Maurice Rose, um, who uh, was from Denver. In fact, they're building a statue in his memory at, at Veterans Park across the street from, Capitol, from the Capitol, and it's gonna be dedicated in, in October. But he was the highest ranking officer to be killed in World War II, March 30th, uh, 1945. He was killed in action. He was a general, um, never graduated high school. He lied, he was in World War I. He lied about his age. He lied about the fact that he said he graduated from high school. 
and eventually was promoted in the field to general, one of the most important generals in World War II. Um, and I have a documentary on him as well. It's on my YouTube channel. Fascinating guy and from Colorado, from Colorado as well. Here he I, was I among the, all these other generals who were West Point graduates. And he, had, he was a high school dropout and he was probably one of the most important jobs. He was promoted by Patton a couple of times in the field because he was just an expert, extra expert warrior. He really did a good job. Devotion was a very good book. I read it. You read it. Yeah, that's going to be coming out in October. And like I said, Adam Mankos, if you ever get him to talk, uh, it's, I can't track him down. He's writing and traveling all the time. So he's a young guy, excellent writer. And Spearhead is another good book. And in Spearhead, they talk about Jim Bates and the Battle of Cologne and shooting the Battle of Cologne, this uh, tank battle. Okay. All right. Very well, thank good. you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming on board.